I'm Nan Jackson. I'm the program director at STAR. And this is the last, unfortunately, of our three-part series on civics. And tonight we'll be talking about state government and um, voter... Um, pardon me? Public financing of, of voting, which to me is the most important subject that we can have <laughs> in this series. Um, I just wanted to also mention to you, there we're doing on Wednesday, June 6th, at 7 p.m., we're having a program on when conversations get difficult, how to communicate in constructive and non-combative ways. And I think as this election gets closer, and we start working for whomever we work for, there would volunteering, there will be many discussions that you'll have with people who don't agree with you. And I think that this is a very helpful class to take in for both political reasons and also personal reasons if you you can bring it from politics to family. But I do think it's very important. So now I just want to introduce and thank Rosie and Vanessa for putting this wonderful series together. Mm -hmm. Hi, and welcome to our third and final session in our three-part series, What's God Got to Do With It? Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. We're Rosie and Vanessa and the organizers of this civic series, and we're from Hudson Valley Empowerment and Research Society, HERS for short. We're a local action group that we started with some other parents of young children about a year and a half ago. While we initially got together to talk about politics, our group has evolved to focus into holding each other accountable to being informed and positive contributors to our community. And here we are, in a room full of people taking time out of their busy lives to learn about state government. Yeah, so thank you, a round of applause for you guys for coming out. <laughs> Um, so a uh, few folks I wanted to introduce uh, and thank some acknowledgments and then I'll introduce our speakers um, we have Jen Clark here from League of Women Voters back there um, you can sign up for their newsletter she can register you to vote if you're not already talk about absentee ballots she's also the assistant attorney for Ulster County so a good person to chat with um, we also have Yvette here. Yvette, you want to raise your hand? And Yvette is um, the chair of Hudson Valley Strong, and she's got some cards that are like committing you to vote um, and a good way to get in contact. So see Yvette, and she, she'll have cards um, for folks as well. Um, also, Joan has brought a petition um, for. <laughs> Joan's got a petition. Um, which I'm sure she'll speak more about, but that is also on the back table with Jen, um, and that's for a Dutchess County uh, campaign finance reform. Um, I'd also like to thank Matt Stinchcomb, who'll be coming a bit later tonight. He, his group, his nonprofit is called Good Work Institute, and they held a class similar to this in, uh, in June of last year. And Rosie and I took the class and were really inspired. It, w it was similar to this, but maybe a bit more focused on Ulster County. So we thought, hey, why don't we do a version of this for Duchess? So um, thanks to Nan and her help, here we are. And thanks to the Star Library for hosting. Um, and another big thank you to Erin and all the good folks over at the Bard Center for Civic Engagement. They really helped us in guiding and shaping uh, this series. Um, Thank you to Kathy, who is here filming for Panda. So this will be on public access television and on YouTube for if you want to watch it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, big thank you to our local businesses for the treats we have tonight. We've been fed well tonight um, by Four Brothers Pizza and Therese of Teaspoon Desserts. She does custom um, sweets. Um, if you ever need something like that, she's really wonderful. Um, so next time you're in Four Brothers Pizza, say thanks, thanks for the pizza, thanks for supporting a civics class. How random and awesome! Um, and also big thank you to our fellow hers members, Morgan, Elena, um, and uh, this has really been a labor of love. So um, it's it's so wonderful to see you all here. 
um, just a little bit about how we approached organizing the class. So this is a nonpartisan series. Learning about how our government works, being critical, active members of our community is everyone's right and everyone's responsibility. Tonight is not about debating any particular issues, but rather about educating ourselves and getting that spark for how to navigate and influence the system that we're in. So tonight we have two speakers again to how our state government works. And we're gonna start out the evening with Blair Horner, speaking about the structure of New York State government. Blair is currently the executive director at the New York Public Interest Research Group, almost as long a name as ours, and also known as NYPERG. So NYPERG is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that engages New Yorkers in public education campaigns designed to produce policies that strengthen our democracy, enhance the rights of consumers and voters, and protect the environment and public health. Blair has held a number of different positions in his over 30 years at the organization, with a brief stint away to work for then Attorney General Cuomo on a website that provides greater transparency for lobbying and government, and another couple of years away working for the American Cancer Society. Blair is a registered lobbyist and will be teaching us tonight not just about how state government works, but also about the roles lobbying and fundraising play in this level of government. And you may recognize his voice as he is a frequent WAMC contributor. <laughs> so Blair's knowledge about fundraising and lobbying segues nicely into our second talk, uh, which we're framing as a case study. So taking a closer look at a topic um, as a way to illustrate how state government functions in real life. So I'm very pleased to introduce Joan Mandel here from Democracy Matters, speaking about campaign finance reform. Since 2001, Joan has been the executive director of Democracy Matters, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization focused on empowering everyday people to be involved in politics. Their internship program has trained close to a thousand young people to be organizers and advocates for campaign finance reform. Their new Restore Democracy Fellowship was instrumental in getting the 2016 presidential candidates to go on the record about their support for public campaign financing. Previously, Joan worked as the campaign manager for a Pennsylvania senator. She's led two two-year grassroots organizing drives in Oakland, and in San Francisco, California, um, that both led to these cities passing campaign finance reform. So, legit, she actually makes stuff happen. Um, she's an associate professor of sociology and anthropology emerita at Colgate, where for 10 years she directed the college's women's study program and founded and oversaw Colgate's Center for Women's Studies. Uh, so we're very lucky to have her tonight as she is a very sought after author and public speaker in civics, electoral politics, and social movements. Um, and she's just returned from lecturing from uh, the University of Iceland where she was speaking about money and politics. So thank you very much and Blair, you're up. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. So I have to make, this is a, a little tricky for our photographer, because uh, I have to hit the space bar for my PowerPoint that goes along with my presentation. So if I keep moving around, hang in there. Uh, and for those of you who heard the comment that Rosie made about my voice uh, and WMC, now you can see why I have, I have a face for radio. Uh, and that makes perfect sense that that's where you would hear me and not see me much anywhere else. Um, so as you heard, uh, I'm a director with NYPERG, New York Public Interest Research Group. I started there in 1979. Uh, I've been a registered lobbyist for NYPERG since 1984. Uh, and uh, my uh, comments are gonna be sort of broad and put some stuff in context. Uh, since I'll be talking a little bit about how interest groups influence the, uh, the process, uh, it will sort of set up where Joan is going to go in terms of what do you do about it. Um, I've, uh, in addition to working in New York, I've lobbied in Washington, uh, in Trenton, New Jersey, so I hit all the garden spots, uh, and uh, I've worked in uh, other states as well, but not as a lobbyist. And so some of the things I'll talk about in, in New York are unique. New York has its own quirks. Uh, it also has a rogues gallery of uh, public officials off to jail, uh, and uh, many of you get into trouble seemingly every day. So who knows what happened today? Um, uh, so I will sort of touch on that, but 
my experience in other states and at the national level is a lot of the things I'm really talking about in terms of interest groups uh, and lobbying and what not-for-profits do uh, is consistent, I think, in terms of uh, what I've experienced in other places, despite sort of the unique flavor to New York. So let's see if I can do this without breaking anything. Uh, there, was, uh, an, there was a concern that, I, like Coco the Gorilla, uh, I would somehow break all this. So let's see how this goes. Ooh. All right, so there's the title. So one of the things you hear about all the time is that New York is a blue state, meaning it has a big Democratic enrollment advantage. As you can see on the slide, that's true. Uh, basically, half the registered voters are Democrats, uh, and the other half are split between um, Republicans and everyone else. And the biggest category of everyone else are the blanks, one of them. Uh, people who are not registered in any political party. Uh, they are the second fastest growing party in the state, even though they're not really much of a party, uh, since they're not in one. Uh, but they're uh, growing at a pace faster than Republicans in New York. So the numbers that you see uh, s continue over time, hue toward blue. Uh, but if you take New York City's enrollment out of the picture, as you see on the slide, um, it's pretty purple with um, the urban areas of outside of New York City being basically Democrat, the rural areas being basically Republican, and the battlegrounds uh, are in the suburbs. Uh, so if you want to get elected statewide as a Republican, you have to be able to bridge from re the Republican base into the blanks and uh, other uh, smaller parties in order to cobble together the kind of coalition that uh, George Pataki had when he got elected three times as governor. But the state is bluer than it was then, so the job is even harder. But so in terms of it uh, being blue, that's true. But for those of us who don't live in New York City, sometimes we're surprised to hear how blue it is because you're like, well, it's pretty red where I am. How is it possible? Well, that's why. Um, I had to change this slide last week, luckily for me. Uh, I was able to get this out before, right around the time I didn't get, I wasn't too fast. Uh, Rosie and Vanessa were cracking the whip. Where's your slideshow? Luckily for me, uh, I was late uh, because I was able to change the Attorney General sl slot from a name to a word. Um, you'll notice that there are all Democrats, although who knows what open is yet? We don't know. It could be uh, the Solicitor General, Barbara Underwood, uh, seems to be the leading candidate to be appointed by the legislature, perhaps as early as Monday, uh, to fill the spot. Uh, this little bullet on the bottom is just, I throw it in just to give you an idea. It sort of gives you a sense of Albany. Um, under the state constitution, there's a limit to how many departments there can be. 20. You can't have more than 20 departments. So what does the state do? They have 20 departments, but they create offices and state agencies uh, to get around the constitutional number. Uh, there's also a provision in the state constitution that says every, all debt has to be voted on by the public. And so what do people do? They come up with public authorities uh, and other development corporations to get around those limits. So it's one of the things that makes New York, uh, New York a fun place to work, is you never exactly know what's going on uh, until you see it. Uh, but uh, that's, I just put that in there to sort of set it up. Okay, the legislature. Um, I've lobbied in, in New York since 1984. Uh, since the dinosaurs roamed the earth until the year 2009, Republicans controlled the state Senate. So there were dinosaurs, people with tricornered hats, they all lived at the same time. Uh, and uh, the Republicans controlled it. There was this, uh, some of you may remember, the complete uh, chaos that ensued when the Democrats took over in 2009, 2010. Republicans have controlled since then and are doing it now with basically a coalition of one enrolled Democrat uh, from Brooklyn, uh, st State Senator Simka Felder, uh, who sits with the Republicans and gives them a majority. And sorry about the typo. Um, in terms of the State Assembly, uh, since Watergate, the Democrats have controlled it, and their enrollment, uh, the, um, the number of seats they control has gone up over time. Uh, there are now, um, I think I go through the numbers in the next slide. Let's see if I can remember. Yes, I do. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of Democrats. Uh, there are four open seats in the, de in the uh, assembly, even though there was just a special election uh, in April. Uh, one legislator passed away. Uh, one had to resign because she was caught with her hand in the cookie jar. 
Uh, and then two uh, state assembly members were elected to the state senate. Uh, so there are four open seats. Those are all seats that Democrats normally win. Uh, so it's entirely possible that when those seats are filled, it could be somewhere in the neighborhood of even more than 104 of the 150 uh, assembly seats. As you can see there uh, in the Senate, it's evenly divided with uh, Simka Felder from Kings County being the king uh, of who controls the state Senate. I mentioned you're very leadership driven. Uh, you've all heard about the three men in a room, it's always men, sometimes four men in a room, sometimes three and a half, <laughs> depends how you do your math, I guess, uh, but they're always men. Uh, and um, uh, the reason for that is under the state constitution, the governor is vested with tremendous power. Uh, one of the most powerful executives in the country. And in a system, American system of checks and balances, the legislature organizes itself with a strong leader model as a way to, to check that executive power. So in the case you always hear about three men in a room, you wonder why it is, that's why. Of course, it gets distorted to a grotesque level uh, in the process, but that's the rationale as to why you have uh, a strong system. And uh, I was asked, by the way, if we wanted to do questions and answers when I'm done. Uh, we could do that. If anybody really wants me to stop and ask a question now, I don't, that's fine with me too. I was also asked to sort of zone in on this area. Now, that's not a very good slide, I admit. Like, what are those lines? Uh, well, the numbers are the numbers of the Senate districts in this area. I zoomed in on a map. Uh, you're over there in Dutchess, so you're in Senate District 41. Uh, the lighter shaded uh, lines, I think, are the lines of the counties. Uh, and the dark, I'm sorry, the lighter shaded uh, the lines of the Senate districts, uh, and the darker ones are the lines of the counties themselves. Other way around. No. Okay. All right, well, there you go. Well, maybe it's my eyesight. Um, but as you can see, uh, you guys were in 41. And um, there are, you know, th depending how you look at it and how many people are here from different areas, uh, three or four uh, Senate districts in the area. We go to the next slide. And this is how that breaks down sort of demographically in each of the, f the three districts, uh, two districts that I identified as closest to here. Uh, you can see uh, the total number of voters, the total number of the population, how that breaks down Democrats versus Republicans. So Larkin's district, for example, the Democrats have a big enrollment advantage. Uh, the Sereno district, the Democrats have an enrollment advantage. Um, and uh, yet both are Republicans. Uh, and so enrollment, party enrollment doesn't always tell you what the outcome will be. But these are contested districts. And increasingly, the Hudson Valley is a contested area between the two parties. As you may have mentioned, I mentioned it before, suburban areas tend to be um, uh, battleground areas, and as the Hudson Valley fills up with people, it's becoming more and more sort of like a suburban uh, uh, entity. Uh, as you can see, predominant, both districts are predominantly white. Uh, you also see that the number of active voters is significantly less than the total of the population. Part of that is because there are a lot of people in the district that are under the age of 18. Part of it is people aren't registered to vote. Um, or some, and some are probably not voters, uh, not citizens, and not, therefore not eligible to vote. Um, so that's sort of the breakdown in terms of Senate. I'll briefly do assembly. An even harder map to sort of decipher. But as you can see, 105, 106, 104, those are your assembly districts here. And, and, and no one, okay, I won't touch the computer anymore. <laughs> Can't take me anywhere. Um, uh, and so this, I looked at uh, four of the four assembly districts. I know this font got smaller, but I was trying to keep it to one slide. Same basic uh, issue. Uh, Democrats ha uh, have a very, very slight enrollment advantage in Assemblymember Skoufis' district. It's Assembly District 99, uh, Assembly District uh, 101, Assemblymember Miller. The Democrats are at a disadvantage. Uh, in Cahill's district, uh, there's a significant Democrat Democratic advantage. Uh, and in the open seat uh, for the now late uh, assembly member, uh, the Democrats have a large enrollment advantage there as well. Again, that doesn't necessarily guarantee victory. Uh, in all of those cases and on the previous slide, if you look at no affiliation, what I call blanks, there are big numbers. So in Scoofus's district, where the uh, Democrats have an enrollment of advantage of roughly uh, 500 voters, 
Um, there are nearly 19,000 unaffiliated voters enrolled in that district. And so really that's where the action is in terms of uh, winning these seats. So that's a little bit on your districts. Thank you. Um, uh, so now I'm going to, now that you've talked, go ahead. Yeah, um, so if Senate District 41, Serino, she's Republican, but there's a big um, advantage of Democrats, so how is she elected? I don't understand. That. Well, I mean, she may well, again, People, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I was told, I, I'm already messing up. I'm supposed to report, uh, say the question back so that the people are filming it. So the question is, how is it possible that a Republican gets elected in a district that is overwhelmingly... With uh, active voters. Okay. Uh, with active voters. Well, active, by the way, is the term the Board of Election uses in terms of, are there, are, is there registration active? Oh, okay. um, uh, well, it could well be that she appeals to Democrats. Uh, just because people are enrolled in Demo as a Democrat doesn't necessarily mean they will vote for Democrats. It depends on who the opponent is and how they feel about it. But you can also see, though, the no affiliation. There's 35,000 unaffiliated voters in terms of, and so if you cobble that together, the nearly 50,000 Republicans with the 30, 35,000 unaffiliated, you romp. Uh, and so again, Republicans uh, that are have an appeal particularly to the non-affiliated voters. Uh, are the ones who can win in those districts. And it's sort of the same way it plays out at the statewide level, um, even though the districts are getting harder and harder. When Larkin first, when it took that seat years ago, I think it was back, probably back in 1990, he was in the assembly before that, that enrollment difference was probably much more narrow, and it swelled over time. But people vote for Larkin. You have to convince them not to vote for Larkin. Uh, and as long as he's there, the guy's 90, uh, he's been able to get the vote. Now he's retiring, so this seat will become an open seat. We'll see what happens. Go ahead. Uh, a little while ago, we talked about the uh, increasing of uh, unaffiliated voters. Right. Can you give us some idea of why that is happening? Or what, what I is think you see it with younger voters. Younger voters are less, even though younger voters, if you look at the polling, uh, tend to be more liberal uh, than, they always are, but they tend to even be more liberal than they have in the past. Uh, in modern times, not when I was young, um, uh, they are less likely to identify with a political party, and so you're that. Um, also, I think as the uh, as elections in the United States have become increasingly nationalized, the brand of Republicans is not particularly appealing to a lot of people in a state like New York, and so I think my guess is that you're also seeing people that might have become Republicans uh, of choosing to affiliate uh, in an unaffiliated way. Would that be also true for Democratic people? It, it could, but again, it depends on how you're viewing the brand. I mean, in the, in New York, uh, Trump, for example, is the brand, right? Uh, he's very unpopular in the state of New York, much more unpopular than he is nationwide. And um, so therefore, people are on the, uh, on the left, moderate left, are much more likely to view themselves as Democrats and feel okay about being a Democrat. Whereas more moderate Republicans may feel like the party has left them because they see the more conservative shift of the party. Go ahead. Do you know if folks who are registered with the party are more likely to actually show up on election day? Um, excuse me? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Being told. I forgot to ask <laughs> your question back there. I'll report back was, why is it that people are, are becoming more unaffiliated? And that was my answer. Thank you. Uh, and the question here is, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, go ahead, why don't you repeat the question so I can say it back without yeah. messing it up. So uh, I was wondering if you know if people who are registered with a party are more likely to actually show up on election day than an unaffiliated Yeah, I, I, the, I don't know the answer. Um, I would think that... Um, People that feel like they have more, are more ideologically in sync with the candidates would be more likely to turn out. Uh, but the voting turnout in New York is so abysmally bad, uh, it covers all categories. Um, I think if there is an advantage, which I, um, just, I would think there would be, it would be relatively small. New York has one of the worst voter turnout, uh, voter participation rates in the country. So from there, on that happy note, let me move to the next thing, which is the legislative session, which I'm enduring, I'm, I'm working in now. Did I say that? Um, 
New York is a part-time legislature. They meet uh, for six months, and this sort of difficult slide to look at shows you the six months. This is the official calendar. Um, they uh, meet. They start in the beginning of uh, January. They typically are scheduled to go to the third week in June. In a typical session, they're here. They're in Albany, sixty some odd days, forty some odd nights, uh, and um, typically the first half of the week they're in Albany. Second half of the week they're working in their districts or at their other jobs, whatever they do. Um, and um, as you can, and the the session is really two halves. One is the first part of it would be January, February, and March. They're focused primarily on the budget. They're supposed to get the budget done by April first, uh, appropriately enough. Uh, and then they do the non-budget part of it, uh, of their issues, April, May, and June. Uh, like everyone else, they leave everything to the last minute. Uh, we all remember doing our term papers and doing all-nighters. Uh, well, they're the same thing here. Uh, the budget deals tend to get done the last few days before the budget is due. Um, and at the end of session in June, in a typical legislative session, roughly 1,200 bills get approved Roughly 800 of them get done in the last week. So it's really sort of banging it out. Sometimes they do all-nighters. It can be crazy. Uh, and they don't know what they're doing, and they're just voting for it. Um, but it, it's, real, it's very, very fast. I mean, again, my experience is in other states, it's not dramatically different. It's just New York has a, a much larger number of bills that get introduced, which I'll gladly discuss, but it's sort of obscure as to why. Um, and so that's the session. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Um, now, I'm a lobbyist. You always, when you think of lobbyists, you think of the guys with, you know, the thousand dollar suits, the Cheshire Grat or Cat Smile, the Gucci loafers, perpetually tan, um, sliding, you know, envelopes of money to legislators. Um, well, that's not me, obviously. I have none of those things. I'm not, and, uh, and, the, and my dermatologist tells me I can't go in the sun. So, um, these are some, so there are groups though that spend a lot of money to influence the government and they are as much a player in what happens in Albany as the legislators themselves. So I want to spend a little bit of time on that uh, and uh, I was promised that I was going to get a hook when I was getting close and so I don't know. So there we go, <laughs> the, the hook, they're, they're warming up the hook. Uh, I'll go quickly through this. Um, uh, I'll talk about these things in detail in a second but the key thing is really the last bullet. Uh, the highest ratio of lobbyists to lawmakers in the country. Congratulations. It's the Empire State. Uh, the ratio is probably higher than that, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 some odd lobbyists per state legislator. Uh, so they have lots of friends. Um, now, I could talk a lot about uh, this stuff and go on and on, but Joan is going to do it, and she's much more interesting anyway. Uh, so I thought I would just sort of tell the story of uh, special interest and uh, poli uh, politics in Albany by using five numbers. There'll be no quiz, uh, there's no math, you don't even have to take notes. Here they are. That's the first five. You can look at them, I can read them to you. $109,600, unlimited, 183.2%, $240 million. What do those mean? And how, Blair, can you explain how Albany works with those numbers? $109,600 and unlimited. $109,600 is the campaign contribution limit under New York State law. Now, sometimes when I go to places, I say, how many of you make $109,600? <laughs> but I'm in, I'm in Rhinebeck, so I'm going to be a little more careful. <laughs> how many of you could write a check for $109,600 per year to the political party of your choice? If there's anyone who wants to raise their hand, please see me after, the, after we're done. Um, tax deduction. Um, the, uh, that's the campaign contribution limit. Who writes those checks? They get written. We know who they are. Wealthy individuals, powerful interest groups. Unlimited is just because in case you really did want to raise your hand, your last name is Gates, for example, uh, and you just didn't want to tell your friends here at the library, um, under New York law you can give soft money donations of as much as you want. Um, and just to show that they have a sense of humor when they write these laws, the uh, account where they put that money is called the housekeeping account. All of us who would think about housekeeping would think about vacuuming and changing light bulbs. Uh, under New York law, you can give as much as you want to the housekeeping account, and they can use it for party building activities, but not for candidates. 
A guy named Bloomberg, when he was mayor, used to write a check for a cool $1 million to the New York State Senate Republican Campaign Committee housekeeping account as a way to stay in their good graces. And guess what? It worked. Next slide. So there you go. In terms of campaign contribution limits, that's how it compares to the rest of the country. We have the highest campaign contribution limits of any state that has limits in the country. Congratulations. <laughs> Next slide. And this is how we compare to the rest of the country. There are some states that don't have limits, 11 of them, but they tend to be states that sound like Wyoming. Uh, and they don't tend to be states that sound like California or Florida. What was soft money that has to do with the housekeeping? Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, hard money is money. You give money, you make a donation, vote for Blair. You give a housekeeping account, you give it to the Republicans, and they hire the polling people, and they hire the voter registration people, and they buy the computers, and they rent the office space, and they pay for the staff, but they never say vote for Blair with that money. They do everything else but that. That's the difference. Next slide. 183. I mentioned before the calendar. Legislature's in session, roughly 60 days, roughly 40 nights. That's the number of campaign fundraisers that occurred at the state capitol during last year's session. 40 nights, roughly, 180 campaign fundraisers. Who do you think they expect to come? People from Brooklyn? I'm going to have a fundraiser at the state capitol. Please drive up the throughway, people from Brooklyn, and make a contribution to me. No, this is fish in a barrel time. These are for lobbyists. And so in New York, you can give campaign contributions at night to the very elected officials that you're lobbying during the day. Next slide. And there's some examples. I picked some local people just to give it a flavor. Um, Vanessa and Rosie were very, they kept telling me, make it local. There you go. But that's not them. There's 183 of these, so it's not just these guys. But that's when they had it. The city beer hall uh, is not, you know, sort of sawdust and stuff on the floor. It's actually a nice place. They call it the city beer hall. The Fort Orange Club is a uh, high-end uh, private club where a lot of these fundraisers occur. People drive up in limousines to go to them. Next slide. 0.2%. Small, we all agree. That's the percentage of New Yorkers that are reported to have made a campaign contribution in one year in New York. 20 million people, roughly 35,000, 35 to 40,000 campaign individuals that made a campaign contribution. More people in prison in New York than are reported to have made a campaign contribution. Now, I'm not equating the two, of course. Although some of the people that get them end up in prison. <laughs> the, re the reason I bring that up is it's not a game for all of us. And the reason that it's so small is because the contribution limits are so high, you'd be a fool to spend all day to call all you guys when you could make one call and get more money from one person than all of us put together. 0.2%. Go ahead. Wouldn't it have more impact, though, if all of your constituents are sending in $5 using the WAMC model, right? So the question is, if you could cobble together, see, I'm learning. It just takes me a while. <laughs> uh, if you can cobble together lots of small donations, wouldn't that balance out uh, the big donation? Short answer would be yes. You have to do a lot of work to get it. Not everybody has a radio station. But Joan is going to go into that in more detail, because there is a way to construct the system uh, that would do what you want. Next slide. There you go. That's the number, 35,000 individuals with reported addresses in the state of New York in one year. Next slide. And just to make it even more miserable, uh, over time, in the years we looked at, again, it's a little bit out of date, but you can imagine it's just gotten worse. You can see the percentage of money that's coming into the system slides toward even bigger donations over time because it's more efficient to do that. Also, the campaign contribution limits adjust for inflation. How nice. Uh, and every four years they go up, unlike often uh, 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 welfare checks for individuals that need assistance. Uh, they don't always get inflation-adjusted checks, but the campaign contribution limits. Go ahead. Where do these statistics come from? Well, it, it, this work was done by us. Well, how do you know 
that only so many people give, say, under one hundred dollars, as opposed. It's uh, all of that is public information. Uh, you can download the entire campaign finance database. Uh, it, it's, uh, if you do it right, you can dump it into an, X, an Excel program and sort it. That's what we do. Um, by the way, if, for those of you in the legal and voters or Common Cause or NYPIRG, we all work together to get that law passed to make them do it because in the old days it would be in handwriting and they would hire the person with the worst handwriting to fill out the forms. <laughs> but now you can download it. You can go to the Board of Elections website, elections.my.gov. You can download the entire campaign finance system and play with it to your heart's content if you have nothing else to do in your life like me. Uh, next slide. $240 million. That's how much money was spent on lobbying last year. Next slide. So as, uh, under New York law, if you're a lobbyist, you have to, if you spend, how am I doing on time? All right. All right. All right. Pick, it up, pick up the pace. Uh, if you, you get paid uh, $5,000 or more, or you anticipate expending $5,000 or more in expenses, you have to register with the state. And so, and then report your activities, how much you spend on lobbying. So that's the definition. Next slide. And uh, this slide's not perfect, but this, the year on top is last year, 2017. The one on the bottom is 2007. And if you went back in time to 1977, which is the first year where lobbying was reported in New York, it goes from roughly six million plus in 1977 to 240 million in 2017. Uh, a growth industry in upstate New York, you don't hear about that much, a true success uh, in terms of economic development. Next slide. Uh, who are they? Well, there's the names. These are the biggest lobbying entities last year. You may have heard of Uber. Uh, for those of you like me who are in the AARP, there we are. Uh, teachers, trial lawyers, pharma, teachers, healthcare, Verizon, rent stabilization, those are the landlords in New York City. Great. So it's not surprising to you, every year when I do this, a lot of health, a lot of education, because state government is really in control of those policies. That's where the biggest money gets spent. Sometimes weird things will pop up, like an Uber comes out of nowhere, uh, just because that year. So a few years ago, when the big fight was on fracking, for example, Exxon was at number one on the list. Next slide. All right, let me... Just hold the questions because I'm already getting yelled at by these guys in the front row. <laughs> uh, next slide. This seems, oh, those two slides. One was on where they're spending the money. The guys before them are the people, that's, they're spending it on people, lobbyists. Next slide. On advertising, the Nuclear Energy Institute, that was fighting me, by the way. We were complaining about them, the governor's plan to spend seven billion of your ratepayer dollars to keep four 1960s era nuke plants open on Lake Ontario. Now there's no money for wind and solar. How did that happen? Huh. Uh, so they were fighting to block us on that. They succeeded. Um, and um, uh, so a lot of stuff, money gets spent, a lot of different groups. Next slide. And here is the, uh, the number. Oh, 5,500 lobbyists in New York. Really, it's like, it's incredible, right? Uh, challenging Walmart. Uh, and uh, representing 4,000 clients. The difference is the client is the person who's paying the lobbyist, the lobbyist is the person getting paid. So in my case, for example, I'm a registered lobbyist, my client is NYPERC. So in that case, it's pretty straightforward. But many lobbyists have multiple clients. Uh, the biggest firms have like 100 clients and have dozens and dozens and dozens of lobbyists. Next slide. I know, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, these guys are going to yank me out, I guess. All right. So what do I do? I've painted a pretty depressing picture, right? Right? Yeah. That's not my job. You're supposed to leave with something inspiring and hopeful. You can win if you know what you're doing. And uh, these are some of the topics that we can talk about uh, later. Part of it that we're going to do tonight at the end is give you some opportunities to figure to do experience what it would be like to be lobbying. Uh, Joan and I, after we get done with our presentations, we're going to talk about lobbying tips and what you can do to go meet with your legislators, what should that meeting look like, and we'll have handy-dandy materials that you can take with you. Let me do it on time. Next slide. This is where you can get more information, and I will leave this slides with the folks here. Next slide. Question time! You had your hand up. Yeah. I was
was wondering if you can tell me what the teacher lobbies have been advocating for recently. Well, the, the uh, what are the teaching unions uh, lobbying? Uh, one of the big groups is New York State United Teachers and their various affiliates. Uh, the big issue for them, really the, the biggest issue, is funding for education. Uh, and they spend a lot of money to make sure that a, a, the, the pot of money spent on K-12 money and college goes up or doesn't go down. Uh, there's often a big fight, and depending on the year, there's a lot of money that comes in from charter school groups. There's usually a small number of hedge fund uh, conservative activists in the city who fund uh, activities to advance charter schools, and the public employee unions don't like that, so there's often there's a lot more money spent fighting those. It's by and large meat and potatoes education policy, which is by and large about money at the state level. A lot of it has to do with things like uh, teacher evaluation, but those are, are um, issues that get debated in the public domain, but really the really where the action is is the uh, $30, billion, $30 billion in the state budget that gets spent uh, on uh, education. In the back, I'll come to you. Go ahead. Yeah, oh. is it purely then about money? For example, um, I'm thinking about skilled nursing facility, that it costs a lot more to put a person into a skilled nursing facility than it does to keep them at home and have people come and see them, Medicaid, for example. Right. So, but the lobbyists go in and the skilled nursing facilities get, you know, the, the government will end up voting to put people in skilled nursing facilities over, oh, that program over something that's less expensive and makes more sense. Which I don't understand that. Does this so help? is it all about money? It is not all about money. Because if it was all about money, you'd still be puffing away a cigarette in a bar. Uh, you would. There are things like that that would still be happening that that don't. Okay. Um, so, a, a skilled citizen uprising can make a difference. They'd be fracking all over the state if it wasn't. If it was, I mean, it was Exxon, right? It's not exactly slouches those guys. But it, by and large, particularly if it's outside of public view, yeah. if it is sort of these money sort of issues. Um, interest groups have an enormous amount of sway because they provide the money that get people elected to office. And because they provide the money to get elected people to get elected to office, they then spend the money to send their emissaries to talk to them at the Capitol and remind them, oh, I was so helpful to you in November, can you be helpful to me now? That sort of system is an cor inherently corrupt one, in my view, uh, but it is what drives a lot of the policy. In, in the way that you're sadly describing. So if the person doesn't want to uh, vote for that that particular thing and they're in office and the people put them there and they don't want to vote for those things, how does that work? Or they have to. That's, what, that's the corrupt part. They have to. Well, they, they feel the pressure to do it, uh, but if the constituents are mobilized and organized, dollar bills do not go into the polling place. Human beings do. And so that's the question. When I glossed over the slide, on how you run campaigns to battle this, you can do it. Um, but it's not an unlimited resources to do that with, and so you end up picking and choosing what are the opportunities now. And uh, Rosie's standing up, which means I have, the hook is here. Um, go ahead. What proportion of those lobbyists are working for nonprofits versus for profit corporations? Uh, it's a hard thing to figure out. I mean, there are not for profits like big hospitals. So they sort of behave like a for-profit. So where are they? Um, I would say that the it's it, the and then there are not-for-profits that hire contract lobbyists, who may also represent big businesses. So it's, it's it's really sort of a hard thing to tease out. But there are a lot of not-for-profit lobbyists, but they tend not to be the. I mean, if I'm at the Capitol, I'm down there a lot. There's usually around a hundred people that are always there. And they are almost always contract lobbyists. And so if you're a not-for-profit and you're not a big one, AARP is a big one, the Cancer Society is a big one, they can hire lobbyists. But most not-for-profits don't have that, Nightberg doesn't have those resources. So we rep our representation is some guy like me running around. And so while there may be a large number of not-for-profits, they don't have the same day-to-day -day impact as the contract guys do, who are the people who show up at the fundraisers at night drop off the business card and make sure the campaign contributions flow. So on that happy note, uh, I will gladly answer any of the questions because I'm here all night. Um, uh, let me stop here because the hook is telling me to move. Uh, and uh, thank you. And we'll turn it over to Joan. Again, Joan.
corner is one of the hardest lock acts to follow in the world. <clears throat> I've known him for 20 years, and I'm always a nervous wreck when I have to follow him. I don't know how to get this down to my level. Does anybody know how to do that? Thank you. I should stand on the chair? No, I'm not going to stand on the chair. So this is great. Um, I moved to the Hudson Valley two years ago, and um, as far as I'm concerned, it is a hotbed of activism. And I don't know if you all are activists yet, but I hope after this series you will become activists, uh, whatever it is that you want to be active at. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what's wrong. I usually do. I usually have to spend quite a bit of time talking about what's wrong, but Blair's done such a miserably <laughs> negative job. And the answer to your question, as far as I'm concerned, is, yeah, it pretty much is all about money, right? Which is what we need to do in order to understand what's going on and in order to fix it. Because you can't fix it unless you know what's broken. Uh, and I've spent the last 17 years working with college students all over the country who are focused like lasers on the idea that big money in politics, big private money in politics, is, as they say, the root of all evil. That that money affects anything and everything you can think about because everything about your lives has to do with the laws that we and our elected officials pass. And money has everything to do with who is elected. So, it, you know, my friends get tired of my saying, well, yeah, but it all comes back to the question of how we fund election campaigns. And it's usually seen as a pretty wonky issue, or at least just as a depressing issue. Um, I find it very hopeful myself, and I hope that I can share with you some of my hopefulness. Um, I do have one negative thing to say that, that uh, Blair didn't mention. I was going to talk a lot about how they're all going to jail. You know, New York State has the record number of sitting legislators who have gone to jail in the last 10 years, right? Um, Pennsylvania is after us, right? But we are way in the lead. And that's because of money almost all the time, right? Um, what Blair told you about New York is also true nationally and also true about most other states. Uh, one other little statistic is that whoever spends the most money almost always wins, right? Republican, Democrat, idiot, genius, right? Whatever it is, almost always whoever spends the most money wins. And since incumbents almost always have the most money, challengers have very, very little chance of winning in most races. So that's the other depressing part of it. In New York State, what was it like? I guess four cycles ago, that 100% of the incumbents who ran in New York State were re-elected, right? In Congress, it's like 97%, and you know what the approval rating of Congress is. So we keep re-electing these people always, over and over and over again, because money matters. We don't want it to have mattered, but it does. Okay, and big money affects everything. I just want to put in um, a, a word about my feminist hat which is one of the things that money affects is the numbers of women who run for office and are elected for office, despite the fact that this year I'm really excited because there are so many terrific women running all over the country. But in fact, in New York and in the Congress and in most states, women represent about 17 or 18 percent of the legislature still. Right? And one of the factors, it's not the only factor, but one of the major factors is that women are underfunded relative to men all the time. And what I'm going to be talking about is an alternative way of funding campaigns. I'm going to be talking about the way in which we can change this system because it is a person, probably man-made system, right? That we fund our election system with private money. We are the only democratic country in the world that only funds our system with private money. Right? Europeans look at us and they say, well, what do you think you're going to get if you let rich individuals fund your election campaigns? You're going to get laws that benefit those individuals and not the majority of people. But anyway, that's what we do. That's what the law is. But it is not a law that is in concrete. It is a law that can be changed. So I want to talk about one way of changing that, and that is by constructing what is called a small donor public financing system. Right. Uh, it's called a lot of things. It's been called clean elections. It's called, in some places, citizen-funded elections. 
Um, it's a voucher system in some places, but there are places all over the United States where you can run for office and have public financing, public money, taxpayer money, that's your big question, where does it come from, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that later. Taxpayer public funding help you run for office, okay? And the, the example that I want to give is New York City. How many people know that there has been public financing of election campaigns in New York since, since 1985, right? It is, it's a secret, I know, I know. I go everywhere and people say, I don't know, I didn't know that, right? It is fully constitutional, right? The notion that the Supreme Court won't allow it. The Supreme Court loves public financing. In the Citizens United decision, the Supreme Court said, if there is public financing, that expands speech. It doesn't contract speech. And we want more speech, so we want public financing. We'll see if they really mean it. But so far, when public financing has been challenged, and it has been challenged every time it's passed, the courts have said, have, have, have upheld it. It is constitutional. So that's a really important point to remember. So I want to talk about, well, let me just read off some of the cities and states that have public financing. First of all, New York City is sort of the poster person for public financing because it's been there so long and it's worked so well. Everybody in New York City who runs for city council, basically, or mayor, except Bloomberg, uh, basically uses public financing. They all do, which is why New York City has a, uh, a, a group of representatives who look a lot like the city itself and who uh, are different from a lot of the people that are representing people in other cities. Um, it was passed in Connecticut in the 1990s, um, in, I'm sorry, 2000, early 2000s. In Connecticut today, you can run for the state legislature with public financing, and about 80% of the people who run in Connecticut use public financing. It was just passed in Seattle, Washington. It's a voucher system, a little bit different. It was just passed in Washington, D.C. about a month ago. And it, there are other places as well. Los Angeles has a public financing system. Many cities and places do. And there are even more places where citizens, citizen groups, are working hard to push for public financing, including in Ulster County and including in Dutchess County, which is why that petition is back there. So let me just talk a little bit about the sort of wonky details of what is a small donor public financing system, right? Which is the model, the model is, is New York. It is a matching system. What that means is that when an individual in New York City, let's say somebody's running in New York City, an individual in New York City gives a $10 contribution to someone who is running for office in New York, the city of New York contributes $6, sorry, $60, it's a six to one match, $60 to that candidate, okay? So I'm running for city council in New York, you give me 10 bucks, the city gives me 60 bucks, that means suddenly I have 70 bucks. If you've given me 100 bucks, right, suddenly I have 700 bucks. The theory is, and the reality is, the evidence is, that in that system, politicians are gonna pay more attention to small donors because the value of going to a small donor becomes similar to a large donor, right? And the advantage of going to your own constituents for money is that obviously you're talking to them, you're, you're introducing yourself, you're campaigning, but also then they have a stake in your election, okay? So the six to one match is where it exists in most places that they do have that kind of match. The money comes from the city, or the money comes from the state as well. The advantages of this six to one match are many. It means in those places with public financing that essentially anybody can run, right? You do not have to be rich, you do not have to be a lawyer, you do not have to know rich people. You can go to ordinary citizens and because that money is expanded by a public match, you can build a large enough, what we call war chest, a large enough amount of money so that you can compete with other folks, right? The argument is that in a publicly financed system, as long as you have enough money to get your message out, you will have an advantage even if you're out um, raised, if, if, you're, uh, if, if your opponent raises more money. This is a voluntary system. The Supreme Court will not let us make it mandatory. 
you have to choose to run with public financing. So you may be running against somebody who is not taking public financing and is raising more money, but you will have, if you have enough of these small donations that get matched, what happens is you will have enough money to get your message out. And your message is a very powerful one. Your message is, I am not bought by anybody but you. My money is coming from the people that I am going to be representing. Yes? Is there an upper limit? Yeah. Yes, there is an upper limit. Well, there's an upper limit to the match, right? Um, it's 250 in New York now? 175, right? Um, if you give me $175, it'll be matched. If you give me more than that, it won't be matched above 175. And most places have a limit about the total amount of money that they you know, are able to, to divide up among the, the people that are running. So, uh, public fund, yeah. Um, and is it only matched if it's, if it's your constituent? In most places, in most places, right? I mean, these, these laws are a little bit fluid. They're different in different places. But the idea, and in most places it is, yes, the idea is that you should be funded by your own constituents, not by somebody, you know, right now these folks go to Texas, they go to Los Angeles, they go to Washington or New York to raise money, everybody does, right? Okay, so it means that anybody can run who has good ideas, who is in tune with their own constituents, not just in order to get signatures on a ballot, not just to get their votes, but actually to get the money to run. What we see in publicly financed systems is a much more diverse group of candidates than in a privately funded system. Big surprise, right? More women run, more young people run, more uh, middle income, never mind low income, middle income people run, more people of color run, right? All those groups that are underfunded if they run for office in a publicly financed system are able to put themselves forward. Um, one of the things about a publicly financed system also, it means that the candidates tend to run grassroots campaigns. They want to knock on the doors of their own constituents. One of the reasons that they want to do that is to raise money, but also to obviously convince people to vote for them. It also means that they are not off in Los Angeles or New York City at big fundraisers or in Albany at big fundraisers all the time. They can be in their own districts talking to constituents, knocking on doors, right? It is not an expensive system in the on average, I mean, it's hard to know in different places, but on average in New York State, if we were able to extend this system from New York City to the state, which is what a group of us have been trying to do for about a decade or more, right, it would cost about $8 per taxpayer per year, okay? I mean, you can't get a latte double thingy without paying $8 <laughs> these days, right? It's, it's, it's cheap. It is, it is not the money, although that's what they will tell you. And the fight back is, Welfare, a nasty word in this country, for politicians, right? So we have an amazing system that we can sell to people, that we can tell people about, but we can't be naive about the pushback because it's going to be enormous. This system, when it happens, is an enormous um, bulwark against the cynicism and the despair and the feelings of apathy that absolutely infect this country, as I'm sure all of you are aware. So when I, I've been organizing students around this issue for years, uh, NYPIRG and, and the League of Women Voters are all supportive of this in New York. There's a broad coalition, uh, and we've been pushing for what's called, we call it Fair Elections New York, right? Um, but it's a very heavy lift. It's a very heavy lift because the people who are calling the shots in Albany clearly do not want this system. The politicians who are there, by and large, have been there because they were able to be successful raising private money. Uh, so that we have to find a way to move them away from the, only their own self-interest and think about the common good, think about the fact that New York is awash in corruption and money uh, and that we can change that as well. So I want to talk, I don't know where I am either in terms of time, I want to talk about some of the specifics in a minute, but go ahead. Where does New York City get the money from to match? Right, okay, so the idea is taxes are phobic in this country, people are hysterical that they have to pay taxes, although we are undertaxed compared to almost any other developed country. Everybody understand that? 
That's what I tell my students. If you don't know anything else, know that we're undertaxed, right? But we don't think we are, so it doesn't matter really, right? The money in New York City comes from the general fund, comes from... Is it budgeted? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, okay? In Arizona, where they passed this, and where they've had lots of trouble because the courts have been fighting them and all kinds of people have been fighting them, they didn't want to say that it was taxes. So what they did when they had public financing, clean elections, they put a, um, a tax, essentially a tax, on felonies and on civil penalties. So if you were driving and got stopped by a state police person, part of the fine that you paid went to fair elections. So you didn't have to say your taxes will be raised. The money is coming from this other place. Now, in fact, if it weren't going to clean elections, it would be going someplace else. So it, it, the money has to come from someplace, and it is public money, so ultimately it's tax money. Uh, income tax returns, there is a little... Yes, there is a little thing that you can check off and nobody does it. <laughs> All right? I mean, if we could get people to check it off and then give their names to the people that they were checking it off, maybe that would work. What does the box say? But it doesn't work. What does it say, the box? I haven't seen it. What does it say? Oh, the box says that this this is a uh, tax deduction that goes towards it's public it's financing. It's a dollar. Um, it's the, a dollar. It's a line. Right. Okay. For the presidential. They've destroyed the pre We had a presidential public financing system. I didn't even mention it because it's, it's no longer functional, right? But in, in 1975, the Congress passed a public financing system right after Watergate because they felt that the presidency was being corrupted. I can't imagine why they thought that, but they thought the presidency was being corrupted by money. And we had many, many years of every single president, including Republicans and Democrats, who ran with public financing. Um, we don't have that anymore. If candidates choose public financing, does that mean they're not allowed to take these giant donations from private donors too, or can they do both? Well, there, there's, there is an issue here, right, because they can continue to take money. There is a limit past which they can't take the money, right? But it is not a pure public financing system. For years, we were arguing for full public financing, which is also doable, right, which would mean I can't take, if I'm running for office, I can only rely on public financing. The way the reform community nationally has developed is to say, that's just not going to fly right now in American history. And what we have to do is back off and say, OK, let's have a first step here, which is public finance, which is a matching system, right? Uh, and hopefully, if we get that passed, we can move on. There are bills in Congress for public financing. Um, it's, it's, it's put in every year. New York, though, has a unique role in this because we have one of the oldest and the best public financing systems in the biggest city, one of the biggest cities in the country. And so, and New York is very important, very influential state. We have a chance to extend what we already have, we're not trying to sell french fries to people, we already have to the state as a whole, and that could make a huge difference. So reform groups come in and organize coalitions every single uh, cycle to try to get this stuff passed. And we've come really, really close. We've been within two or three votes uh, of the Senate a couple of times. Um, and many of us think that the next few years are going to be absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. So let me talk briefly um, ab about what you can do. Um, and Blair is absolutely right. Organized citizens can make an enormous difference. And that's why I spend my life running around talking to college students. Because when they move, as you saw the high school students move a couple of months ago, all kinds of wonderful things can happen. Uh, so one of the things that you can do is to link up with some of these groups that are already advocating for public financing of election campaigns. And I think there's a, a handout that I gave you that lists some of these. And we can read more about it. We can link up with these groups as well. The, other thing you can do is start in your own community, which is, I'm a huge advocate for organizing in your own community. And one of the things that you can do there is start lobbying, if we're talking about the state, start lobbying your state representative. I took a group of 35 or 40 college students to talk to Sue Serino uh, a few weeks ago about this. Um, I'm not going to talk in a partisan way, so I'm not going to say what she thought or didn't think about it. But it was very empowering for those students to tell her what they thought. 
uh, whether she will listen to them or not, there's a lot of pressure on any sitting legislature from the side that says, don't do this. Mm -hmm. And if this is something we want, we have to push from the other side. So if you have a sitting legislature, let's say who's totally against donuts, right? Um, and you know you're not going to convince that person to eat donuts no matter vote for donuts no matter what. You still have to talk to that person. You still have to go and say, I'm representing, you know, 100 people from Rhinebeck or the Hudson Valley, and I love donuts, and I think you should be voting for donuts. It makes a huge difference. I was a campaign manager for a member of Congress, and these folks listen to the real live people that get in their offices. If you can't get in an office, you can make phone calls. You can write letters, particularly handwritten letters, right? You can send valentines. You can do all kinds of things to think out of the box to let these people know that you are paying attention to what they're doing and there's something you want from them, right? And that you're a voter, right? And the reason it's, it's important to do it in groups is you're not just representing you, right? You have organized other people, whether it's a neighborhood or a community or whatever. So that kind of pressure on these folks is really, really important. Um, giving them money is important too, but we don't have the kind of money that usually is working against campaign finance reform. What we do have is the people, because if you look at national polls, over 80% of the American people think the system is broken because of money. Everybody thinks this stinks, and everybody wants to change it. People just don't know quite what to do or how to go about doing it. But it's the old-fashioned stuff of organizing the people around you. Let me just mention one other quick thing, which is passing local resolutions that you then send to uh, Albany, to Governor Cuomo, to your elected officials. You can send it to the whole kit and caboodle of them, right? Rhinebeck citizens for, you know, good things got the Rhinebeck City Council or Town Council or Dutchess County, which is what we're trying to do, to pass a resolution that said the Dutchess County Legislature or the Rhinebeck Town Council urges you to pass public financing, and then you give them all your reasons why, right? Because it's a democracy and we're supposed to listen to the people, not the people with money. Those kinds of things, when they're organized, that's how they stop fracking, right? When this fracking fight started, I told people, there's no way we're stopping fracking in New York State. There is just no way. And then all these people at local levels bubbled up and organized and kept at it. you got to keep at it. I'm 74 years old. I've been doing this since I was 16, right? I'm not tired because this is what you do. This is what you do in a democracy. You've got to make your voice heard. And if you can do it by organizing with other people, so much the better. Vanessa. Um, so it seems to make so much sense. Literally, like, what is the argument against this? When you go to a politician, you say, we should have public campaign financing. Well, just, What's their argument? Well, uh, there are two of them. <laughs> One is, we do not have the money, right? Would you want us to spend money on, they don't say democracy, that's what I say, on publicly financing elections when our schools are underfunded, when our police are underfunded? They go through all the social categories that are underfunded. And guess why they're underfunded? Because those folks underfund them. Right? And then use that as a way of saying, we just, we'd love to do this, but we just can't afford it, right? Or they say what I said, which is, this is welfare for politicians. Do you really want to give these horrible politicians that you hate your money as taxpayers? Well, you're not giving it to them, you're giving it to everybody, right? You're giving public financing so you guys can run for office, so all of us can run for office. And not just, nothing personal if anybody's a rich lawyer here, but not just rich lawyers, right? Which is, which is where we are now. Money is absolutely so influential, but numbers always, always trump money when there's a roused citizenry. And as I said, this is a hard lift because people think this is a wonky issue. There's nothing wonky about this. This is the lifeblood of everything that you think about, including whether there's electricity coming into this or whether there, you know, people were cleaning up after the tornadoes the other day or whether the Hudson is still clean or whether your kids can go to a decent school. It's everywhere. It is the root of all evil. And it's something that really, really can be changed. And there are lots and lots of people working on this all over the country. I 
you know, I'm a 60s baby, I'm a cockeyed optimist, I understand that. I think it's time has come. I think it's time has come. I'm just curious, what, what are the takeaways from the places that it's been successful? Like, what, what do we know about those places that's made Well, what we know, as I say, that you get a much more, you give, you give voters a much greater choice of candidates. Well, I mean, how did it happen? Like, how, how are those grassroots successful? Grassroots organizing every single time. Every single time. It was people, you know, getting together, fighting these fights. It's a long fight, right? Because we've got a big enemy out there but people who were consistent and kept at it. And in New York, as I say, this has been going on for quite a, quite a long time, and Ken Blair can speak to it too. Um, you know, we go lobby for it all the time uh, and, and push people and try to get people to run saying that this is their issue or an issue that they will, in fact, support. So, you know, go to your, whoever's running at the, for your state representatives this time, or Congress, Go to their meetings and raise your hand and say, are you in favor of not just campaign finance reform, but public financing of elections? And will you vote for this on your first day in office? Right? Yes, Joel. So the next meeting for the Dutchess County Legislature is Monday, June 11th. And because uh, I knew you guys were going to be here, last Wednesday I submitted two local laws. One is basically a copycat version of what also County Executive Mike Hines submitted in January for uh, public financing of elections in the Ulster County. And the other law I submitted is basically a copycat version of what the Suffolk County Legislature passed in December. That, let me just interrupt you one second. That's what I forgot to say. We have now a county in New York that has passed public financing for the first time, and that is Suffolk County, and it happened in December. And then uh, a couple days ago, Monday night, at the last meeting of the county legislature, I circulated a letter. Only one county legislator signed on to it, basically for for the principle of public financing of elections, it was Nick Page of Beacon. Would it be a good idea for the people in this room to send emails to county legislators at DutchessNY.gov <laughs> and to come to the next meeting of the county legislature <laughs> Monday, June 11th, to speak up for this? Uh, sure. <laughs> yes, yes. And there are groups here locally that are working on this, that are doing this, that are coming to the legislature. Um, I would urge everybody to do that. but. This kind of stuff, you know, you need to do it with people that you know and that you work with because it takes a long time. It's not coming to one legislative meeting. So what I really suggest, in addition to that, is to get together with the folks you know and are thinking about doing something politically and either focus on this or add this to your agenda, right? This may not be your highest priority. You may be an environmentalist. You may be working for, for uh, you know, against gun violence. You may whatever you care about, make this your second one. What's make money in politics your second priority and do something about that as well. What's the name of the organization with that petition in back? That is the Dutchess County Progressive Action Alliance, the DCPAA. Full disclosure, I'm a member of that. It's a nonpartisan organization. Um, it works with the indivisibles for those people that know what that means as well. So, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I want to leave everybody excited, um, but I don't want to be naive about it. This is a tough one, but this is the reform that will enable all those other reforms to be passed. This is the reform that means we don't have to continue to bang our head against the wall for this reform and this reform and this reform where we're all divided from each other and working in our little sort of silos. This is the one that we can all get together on and have the power to be able to change things. So thank you for listening. All right, so we go. Yeah, All right. let me get you in the All right, so we did a pretty good job, Joan and I, of preparing for tonight. We sort of played off each other. I thought reasonably well, right? Yeah. Sort of fit together, hand in glove. Now yeah, this part of it, we're not 100% sure we got this all down yet. So here's what we're here's what we're considering, uh, and it requires uh, your help. So here's the theory. The theory is that you're tired of hearing from us. I mean, maybe not Joe. Certainly me. Uh, and. Uh, that we would, uh, we thought that it would be good to try to go through what it is actually like to lobby. 
as a grassroots activist. And on all of your seats... Let me just interrupt. Sure. How many people have lobbied before? Okay, great. Great. And so on your seats, you have a 10 tips thing for both of our organizations on joint letterhead. That is for your, you know, uh, uh, help. Uh, but we are also thinking about uh, actually trying to design a sort of interactive part of the meeting. Um, and I can't wait to see how this goes. Uh, to uh, give you some sense of what it would be like in terms of organizing for a meeting. So we have another handout here about a sample agenda if you were to set up a meeting for a legislator. So, so let me just stop one second here, though, Jim. What do people think about that? Let's do that. We have a thumbs up. We have any thumbs down? Okay. Just want to make sure. All right. All right. And there's a lot of people looking at me in a funny way. Like, <laughs> stop talking, please. Let, <laughs> not, not, pretty sad. Imagine you have to lose every day. I mean, I always keep my glasses off. Go ahead, Jim. Sure. So we were trying to divide up, but I think we're not going to do this. We'll have to do it as a whole. It doesn't look like there's really, by the time we move everybody around. So um, what issue would people suggest that we're going to lobby on? You can pick any issue. We'll sort of try to come donuts. to a consensus. <laughs> donuts. Is right. That's a sure winner. That's the thing about donuts. Right? What about the big gun issue? Erbo. Mm -hmm. Extreme risk protection order. It's a red flag law. I'm, I'm sorry. She said the gun issue. I said okay. the extreme risk protection order. Um, okay. Is everybody good with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain what that is? What that is exactly? Sure. That, so, um, would you come on up? Yvette, can you yell the? Yeah, sure. Yvette is a great organizer, also. Thank you. So um, one of my hats is the communications lead for Moms Demand Action um, for Gun Sense in America here in the Hudson Valley chapter. And recently we lobbied in Albany um, um, on behalf of ERPO, which is the Extreme Risk Protection Order. And that would allow family members and loved ones to alert law enforcement if somebody is at risk to themselves or others and there are guns in the home, um, notifying law enforcement so that they could remove the guns from the home and then the person would be able to um, see a judge within, I believe it's three days, and the judge would decide whether the guns could be um, returned or whether they would be um, held until a future date um, by which a certain amount of time had passed. So we lobbied um, Senator Susserino and a bunch of other legislatures on this issue. Okay, so wherever you are on this issue, let's say that that's what we're going to do, okay? We're going to go to Albany, or we're going to try to go to Albany, and we're going to lobby uh, uh, on this issue, okay? So the first thing that you need to do, aside from getting a group of folks to go with, if you can, because you don't really want to go by yourself if you can help it, is to make an appointment, right? To try to get an appointment with your legislator or a legislator. So what's the best way to do that? Telephone. Okay, you're going to call the office. What, where, what office are you going to call? I'm going to call the local, my local office. You're going to call the local office. You want to see the person locally? Okay. I mean, and, gen generally the offices of particularly state or congressional legislators, they have district offices and they have their legislative office. And the district office staff are organized to deal with constituent needs and so that's their job, right? And so if you're calling the constituent office, you're going to get those people. It's a different, often a different set of people. So. Right. And is there somebody you're going to ask for specifically? Or uh, does anybody know? Who, who, okay, well, I'll do this. You should ask for their scheduler, right? You should say, I want to talk to the scheduler because I want to schedule an appointment with uh, Senator Bean, right? Okay. First name, Coffee. Coffee Bean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then they're going to say to you what, Blair? What are they going to say? They're going to say, uh, I can't hear you on the phone. You just speak up. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to say, uh, where do you live? That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to tell them where you live. Or you can do that ahead of time. And they're going to basically want to know if you vote, right? And then they're going to want to know, is it only you? Right? So better to have a group. Doesn't have to be a group with a big fat name, right? It doesn't have to be, we're from the League of Women Voters, although that probably would get you in the door, right? But it can be, well, this is me and, you know, 10 of my closest friends, my neighbors, whatever. So if you're trying to get an appointment, it's not that easy sometimes. You want to make sure they know you're a voter, that you vote, that you're from the area, 
and that you have other people coming with you. Uh, they will want to know what you want to lobby about. You'll tell them the issue as well. So you need all that information in order to sound like there's somebody that they really should give an appointment to. Now, I mean, again, so there's, you know, when you show up as a constituent, they're not going to expect you necessarily to be the world's expert on the issue. If Blair shows up who's a lobbyist, they're going to expect something different from me. They want authenticity from you. They want passion from you. They don't want you to rip their heads off, but they want passion from you and a certain amount of uh, interest. So the idea, as Joan was saying, when you schedule the meeting, the, the hardest part for anyone to do this is to actually do the meeting, right? Because it's a weird thing. Right, for most people to go to see their legislator. Right? So they see them maybe at the supermarket and they're in their you know, feety pajamas and it's like, oh, this is a person. Uh, but when you see them behind the desk and they have their suit on, it's a different ball game or their staff. And so what we're trying to do a little bit now is to sort of deconstruct what the meeting would normally look like so that if you choose to do this, uh, you would be able to sort of feel more comfortable at it and that's what we're going to try to do. Yeah, and one, one more thing to say. Sometimes they just won't, they won't meet with you, period, right? Um, I mean, I've had students call and they say, um, oh, she's very busy or he's very busy. They call and call and call and call, right? Uh, if they will not see you, you should threaten them. You should say to them, I'm going to write to my local paper and say that you will not see me. I'm a constituent. Or I'm going to bring my friends and I'm going to pick at your office until you see me. Okay. Now you don't have to do all that kind of stuff. But I mean, my guess it doesn't is, hurt. I, my guess is they're going to want they'll come they'll set up a time to meet with you. You may meet maybe not with the legislator because they're very busy. Blah blah blah. But you, I mean the first time you do. Go ahead. Well, uh, what's a blanket? How many refusals before you threaten? Uh, <laughs> do, do you let two go by and then the third refusal, or do you do you give them even more than that's three? Your, that's your gut. Um, I, I'm an impatient person. I've been doing this a lot, so I don't let it go very long. Um, but, you know, that's, it's really a personal decision, obviously. And, and they will say you can't meet with the, um, the senator, but you can meet with the staff, and you should always say, I'm glad to meet with the staff. I mean, we're in, remember, you're in the persuasion business, not the debating business. So, yes, I mean, you're trying to persuade someone to agree with you. And like when you're in a bar talking to your friends, uh, debating them to death doesn't always get them to do what you want, right? It may get their back up, in fact, and they do the opposite just because that's the way humans are. So we're in the persuasion business. The one, you're not going to win it over on one meeting, but it's an important, as Joe mentioned before, it's important to meet with your legislator so that he or she knows that people in the district care. I would be surprised if a, a successfully elected official blows off their constituents uh, uh, on a regular basis uh, and expects to get reelected for long. I mean, so I, I, I you know, let's, let's just, most cases, you're going to call them up and they're going to assign you to a staff person. I think that's a fair way to sort of start it off, which, as Joan mentioned, is a, a good meeting, but it's the scary one, it's the first one. And so you have two sheets of paper. One is the 10 tips with the Democracy Matters Nightbird logo on top, which was on your seat when you came in. That sort of goes through how to prepare for the meeting. And I just handed out, and it says sample agenda on it, what normally you would be doing in a meeting. You're not going to be there for hours. You could, but you can't assume that. You don't want to use up their time. You don't want to use up your own time. You want to get in, tell them what it is you want, and get out. So that what you have on the sample agenda is sort of a timetable and a flow. Because that's the scary part, right? Well, what do you do when you get in there, right? So what happens? So we're trying, to, we're trying to break that down, and we're also, I'm talking so that Joan can keep thinking about where did the two of us go from here uh, in this part of the workshop. Uh, Joan? Okay. <laughs> we have an appointment, right? Um, we do not have to meet with the other people in the group ahead of time, but it's a good idea to do that and to decide what you're going to say, decide who's going to say what, right? Just add one quick thing. One of the threshold questions will be, are you going in with a bunch of groups? Are you representing a group? Or are you going in with your neighbors? Uh, in both cases, Joan is quite right, you would want to have a pre-meeting to discuss who leads, what are we all going to say, so that people don't feel uh, like 
there's someone else is taking their story, whatever the heck it is, right, on your issue, if it's gun violence or something. So you, it, the pre-meeting is a good place to sort of go through that, and someone has to be the recognized leader, because the last thing in the world you want to do is go to the meeting and then start fighting among yourselves <laughs> as to who is the leader, uh, which really ruins the whole meeting. It really just ruins the whole thing. Yeah. I have a question. When you said going in with a group or your neighbors, I would assume that um, the topic you're discussing would might be more influential, whether it's your neighbors or a group, such as gun law, such as any type of gun lobbying, for example. If I have children in school, going in with my neighbors that have children in school might be more influential sure. or important to the person you're trying to lobby. Yeah, I, I, I think I think both are. Okay. I think that sometimes when someone comes in who is not part of groups but has just gotten together, you're like you're you're like a real citizen, right? And they really respond to that okay. as opposed to coming in a group which has some clout, which also they're, they're responding to. I would say either one. Yeah, I, and 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 it could be both, right? You could be uh, the president of your local PTA, mm -hmm. and you want to organize uh, fa uh, uh, parents to go see a particular legislator. Uh, you may be a member of your local League of Women Voters, uh, and you want to go in with various organizations like uh, that are organizing this event and go in to show, because if you're, the heads of those organizations are there, presumably they have their own constituencies, which means the numbers are bigger. If you're going in with a passionate number of, of but small number of individuals, the numbers aren't, but the people are actually the neighbors of the people that are the legislators, and so that also has an impact. The more you can make them a these meetings constituent-based, the more impact it's going to have. They care about voters, and if they don't, they're gone. They get that. Uh, and it most, again, the vast, uh, actually, a very large percentage of people don't vote. Uh, so if people are intense enough to show up at their office, they think there's 100 more like you. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have two questions. How effective are lobbying days for instance, you know, library advocates lobbying day when we all get on buses and go, go to Albany. That's number one. And number two, um, if you cannot meet with the legislator, but the staff member says, well, I don't speak for the legislator, when you ask the question as to what is the opinion of Senator Serino, for instance, on this issue, and you're told, well, I don't speak for the Senate then why would you meet with a staff member? Mm -hmm. right. well, let me take the first and you can take the second because that's hard. You take both I think the, the lobby days are great. I mean, when they see lots of people come, it makes a difference. I mean, you, somebody has organized those people, and Blair's right. For every person that they see who's been organized, they think there's a bunch of them back home. So I would say lobby days are, are a great way to do that. Um, you know, they can't speak for the legislature, le legislator, but the legislator does have a record and has voted for X, Y, or Z, and if they don't know who, what their legislator has voted for, you need to tell them that they need to find out and get back to you. Or right? they're not willing to tell you. If well, they're not willing to tell go ahead. Let me just mention, on the, on the lobby day, you don't win bat uh, legislative battles because you have a lobby day, no. right? You ha it has to be a comprehensive campaign built on a strategy that includes coalition building, district visits, lobby days. If you don't have a lobby day, it can hurt you. you. If you have a lobby day that's poorly attended, it can hurt you. It's an important component as, in terms of mobilizing your troops. It does show strength if you do it right at the, uh, in Albany, but it's an enhancement to the basic blocking and tackling of running a good political campaign, nonpartisan. Blocking and tackling, for those of you who are not sports guys, is, has to do with football. Um, second issue is, if the, they say they don't represent, like, look, the most important thing an advocate has is one word, is tenacity. You're not going to have one meeting with a legislator and that's it. If they say, I don't speak for the legislator, you say, okay, well here's what I think, I'll be back. And either you tell me what the answer is, or please have the legislator available to tell me what the answer is. It's persistence. you got to go back. And so the less intimidated you are, by the person in the, in the suit behind the desk with the flags behind him and pictures of, you know, them, you know, smiling with Bill Clinton or whatever the heck it is, or George Bush, you know, piled up behind them, you know, the, the wall of intimidation that they all have. The less you are distracted by that, the more you get used to this, the more persistent you are, the more persistent you are, the more likely you are to win. 
These are not one-shot deals. There's no magic bullet. The only thing that you could do, the one thing that you could do that really would have a big impact is write a check for $109,000. And if you can't do that, then you have to do the things we're talking about. Well, I could write the check, but... <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. Sign Joan's name, you'll Too be fine. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, but lobby days usually are you know, the result of that kind of grassroots organizing. It's just, it's, it's, they're huge because of that. Okay, so you're in the room, right? You've had your meeting. You know who the leader is. And the first thing you do is well, we have introduce to. yourselves. Right. What haven't we, we done? We have it written down. Okay. We, we introduce ourselves. We say where we live, right? Um, so we make sure that they know that we're their constituent, right? And then whatever you've planned ahead of time, people go and say, I, I like the idea of everybody saying something. I like the idea of everybody talking for a couple of minutes, talking about a different aspect of the issue. But you need to talk about I. You need to talk about your story, your passion. That's the really most important thing. That's absolutely true. I mean, I, we'll come to your question. Let me just mention, that's absolutely true. Um, by the way, it depends on the size of the group about how many people well, They won't speak, let right? you in with like 30. If you, if you have, right, if you have a lot of people come in on lobby days where there's a lot of people showing up, then it's very hard to have everybody speak and you have to sort of figure it out. If you have a handful of people going into the room, then I totally agree with Joan. Everyone should have their piece of the action. If it's a coalition of groups, then everybody has their own perspective. If it's a bunch of individuals, then to speak with a personal story that conveys emotion, not rational thought. Emotion drives people, not brainiacs. And so if you feel emotionally about an issue, like you can feel me saying it now, right? You hear it. You feel it. That's what you have to convey in the meeting if you particularly want to be effective. You saw the slide before. 5,500 lobbyists. These guys are deluged with people asking for favors all day. They remember the emotional constituent. Not the one out of control. Not the one shrieking. But the one that conveys the emotion of how they feel about that issue. Because they're going to feel it. They have very good antennae. That's why they get elected. They're human barometers. They respond to pressure. And if they he feel the pressure from you in that room, they will remember that meeting. Doesn't mean they'll agree. One meeting doesn't do it. There's no silver bullet. But if, if a persistent, large-scale effort, particularly of constituents, you can move legislators and therefore move public policy. Sorry. Exactly. Um, I think that... I'm, I'm sorry, she... Oh, the, the, I'm sorry. Go. So, I was going to ask how many people to bring, and I think you said six. Yeah, six. They often say to you, we can't handle more than X, right? But you can go to different constituents. Lots of times when I bring students, I take them to their own constituent, and then we do what's called drive-by lobbying. We just stop at people's offices, whether they're con we're constituents or not, we're already there, right? This is when you're in Albany as opposed to the, you know, the local office. And you, you leave them a piece of paper. You say, you know, the piece of paper says we're students and we care about this issue. Sometimes they're there. Sometimes a staff person will talk to you. Um, you know, use your time while there. There's no reason to just talk to your own legislator if you're in Albany. Um, go ahead. Just, again, I... The more you do it, the easier it is. The easier it is, the more effective you'll be. If you care about whatever it is you care about, we heard about guns before, you, care, you heard about public financing here, the, the more you convey that to your elected officials, the more they're going to, because no one talks to them, right? And so you might as well accept the 5,500 lobbyists and the occasional rubber chicken you know, event, like they come here and they talk to you and then they're on their merry way. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's the it's the the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I have, one other, I have one other thing to say, which is that often these these folks are very good at hijacking the conversation. They will want to give you a campaign speech. They will want to tell you all the wonderful things that they've done for you forever. Um, and you have to you have to experiment. You have to learn, though, to say that's very nice, Senator, but I'm here to talk about boo, you know, whatever it is. So, um, you know, they work for you, uh, and you don't have to be hostile. I mean, I, I, I get, well, I get hostile, but <laughs> you shouldn't be hostile, right? Well, there was number seven on your top ten tips <laughs> right, exactly. uh, is about controlling the meeting, because Joan's right, if you have a 20-minute meeting and 15 minutes of it are about working the vineyards uh, in Italy uh, in the 1950s, then, you know, you're 15 minutes ago, and you don't get a lot of time to talk about why you're there. This is your meeting. This is um, your meeting. 
So why don't we talk a little bit about what the meeting would look like? Okay, so Joan's right. You come into a meeting, they're at the desk, or you're at a table, depending on the size. You come in, Joel knows what this is all about. He gets these meetings. Um, people come in, someone's assigned to sort of set it, set it up. Thank you. You introduce everyone. Everyone goes around the, around the table or on the couch, wherever you're set up, and makes their, um, their observation, whatever it is. At the end, of the, there then you want to get a dialogue going. You don't want to have the whole meeting be you talking to them. Uh, that's called a monologue, <laughs> not a dialogue. So you want to give enough time to say, and what do you think? So that they have to say something. Now they may say, I don't speak for the legislator, therefore this is a very short meeting. Um, and, and you have to game those kinds of uh, responses out in advance if you prepare for the meeting. If it's possible, you get that kind of answer. You, who's the person who's going to say, well, that's good to know. We'll be back. Uh, and please let me know, or I'll call you tomorrow. Or, uh, we'll, you know, we'll be back in a week. Whatever the heck it is that you want to do. Um, the meeting itself, though, is that is relatively straightforward. And, the, and it is a relatively short period of time that you're there. So the outline that we gave you breaks it down even by time as to how much you would spend on different topics. The 10, the ten tips talk about some of the things that Joan was talking about. For example, controlling the meeting itself. Um, those are both of things. Those are useful things. And uh, if uh, and so let me just sort of stop there. They ask. Yeah, at when the you're at you, the the question. I mean, I when I lobby, I usually do this, that the ask twice. I come in, I say, "Hi, I'm Blair. I work for NYPIRG. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about Assembly Bill One Two Three Four. Uh, we support the bill. We want you to go on as a co-sponsor. We want you to vote for the bill. Whatever the heck it is we want you to do. And then I sort of get into a little re reason as to why there's a problem and then why the bill is a solution. What do you think? At the end of that, I come back and I say, um, so you've heard what we had to say. Do you have any thoughts on the bill? What do you think? And you, then they, they say something. You say, well, again, we are asking you to do whatever it is. Um, it could be to go on as a sponsor of the bill. Uh, if it's a it could be a resolution at the county legislative level. Let's say you decide after this meeting you want to push uh, for legislators to support a resolution that Joan was talking about and Joel was talking about in support of public financing in Dutchess County Legislature. So that's the ask. Will you sign Joel's letter? Or will you sign on to the resolution that's being circulated? Whatever it is, it's specific. It's a specific ask, not just did you have a good day today. Um, now, they may not give you an answer. What's a normal answer? A grown-up answer is, well, let me look at it, right? I mean, it's not. Now, they know in advance you set up the meeting. We're coming in to talk to you about Assembly Bill 1, 2, 3, 4. So not like it's coming out of, like, out of space to them. They know why you're there. But it's not an unreasonable thing for someone to say, well, I haven't really thought about it from your perspective. Let me think about it. And then the answer is, oh, great. We'll get back to you tomorrow or next week or whatever the heck it is you want to do. Um, because it is a dialogue. You want your legislator to feel that you're on top of it. You're not going to be easily dissuaded. You're giving very direct sort of messages. It's not vague. It's not scary. It's not threatening. Although Joan likes to threaten. But you can see why. Joan is fierce. I'm sort of a pushover. Um, and it's direct, but it's persistent. That I can't stress this That's enough. Right. You do one meeting and you're done, you lose. That's not the way this works. You have to be persistent because then they know you care. Uh, and that can, that can move mountains. Sorry, I'm monologuing myself. Go ahead. Um, if you are not in the office, whether in a district or whatever, if you're on the phone, how effective? If you write an individual email letter, how effective? A longhand. <laughs> what what works? There's a, I mean, there is a pecking order. Yeah. Being there in person, yeah. obviously, right. is the most important, right? right. Um, it it depends on whether you know, handwritten letters are great, right? Um, phone calls are great, emails are great. Getting on their Facebook page and giving them a hard time can work also. Um, it's hard to know. They are counting all of those yeah. things, right? Um, I don't know if there has. I, I, I agree. I agree with what Joan said. I mean, everything matters. Doing nothing is the worst thing. 
thinking about it and talking to your, your friends and bemoaning the state of the country, uh, that's fine. I mean, you know, it's good for cocktails. Maybe you get a few beers bought for you at the bar. I mean, I think yes, that's good. But in terms of moving, persuading the policy, the, the opinion maker or the public official, that is about an, a dialogue with them. Uh, and so the, the more personal the dialogue, the more effective the dialogue, because you emote physically, not just verbally. Um, so, so sending an email may be the least effective thing you can do in terms of doing an action, but it's more effective than doing nothing. So all of these things matter. The more it seems like it's a programmed, organized activity, and the less personal it is, the less effective it is. But it's always more effective than doing nothing. The more personal it is, the more authentic it is coming out of your mouth or the, your handwriting on a piece of paper, the more effective it is to that legislator because they know their constituent cares enough about this that in their busy day they took time out to talk to me about this. That is something I should think about. I once had a legislator, I'll get to you one second. A guy who was, I, when I started with Nyperg, I was a student. I was a grad student. And uh, there was a guy and we, in Nyperg, you get elected to the board of directors as students from the schools. And I was on the board. This other guy was on the board. He was a Republican. I was a blank. Uh, and uh, uh, he became an assembly member. I got stuck with Nyperg, right? So who wins, right? Anyhow, so I once went into him with my interns and I said, what's the most effective thing? I mean, how many touches does it take? He said, I get 15 real letters. It's at the top of my list. 15. He's an assembly member with 125,000 people in his district. 15. And if, again, not, not pre-programmed, spitting it out, because that number then goes to like 1,000, right? But 15 real letters from authentic people, that moved the, the needle for him in terms of what... Now, it didn't mean he would do it, right? He has his own view, and he has to count votes, and he has his ideological uh, sort of perspective, and his money. team, and all, and all that stuff, right? But 15, that's what he told me, 15. And then if you do it again, and you write another letter, right? Let me just say one other thing. If you go, we're talking about going to them. They come to you too, right? They give town meetings, they give whatever, speeches. If you go to those speeches and you ask questions, that's very, very effective. Because you're putting on them uh, on the spot in front of lots and lots of other people. That's another way to get to them as well. Although it's a different venue, right? So it's theater gets more involved when you're in the public domain. Um, you know, because you're trying to not only to play to them but to the audience and trying to move the audience to your side. It's not the same thing. It's when you're in their office, it's, true. it's more like you're talking to them, and you're really engaged. You're trying to get them to come back, feedback to you, and you're trying to create a connection. You're in an audience like this, and they're standing up here like us. Uh, then it's like, well, it's, it's talking to him to get the question, but you're also saying, how do I get all these other people to be like, yeah, yeah, what she said, right? So, and then it's like, oh, Jesus, I'm losing control of the meeting that I set up. So it's a different dynamic in terms of that. But you are but, educating but, the other people in the room right. as well. And, and, but you, again, it's a persistence thing. And I really, uh, again, from my perspective, again, I'm only speaking from, I really don't think that hostility moves people necessarily. I mean, it scares them, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Um, but most of the time, we're just regular people. The more authentic we are is when we are being ourselves and not trying to be something we're not. And most people are, you know, normal, nice people that live in communities that care about what's going on. And to the extent that they bring that to the meeting, it's very persuasive. If you snap out, then they can think, well, it's just a partisan attack. They're really just Democratic, you know, hacks in, you know, out to get me, uh, or Republican hacks out to get me, whatever it is. And they, they, they can sort of, sort of not think, not hear it the same way. Sorry. Well, let, me, no, let me just, since you're setting me up as a straw person who is hostile and screaming at these people, I just want to, I just want to come back. <laughs> uh, I've been in lots of meetings where people are way too quiet and way too... Oh, not making a firm statement, yes. and you need to be assertive. Yes. Right? yes, 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 yes. Well, so this sort of speaks to what you were just talking about, which is, what if there's an elephant in the room, like, here I am meeting you as a constituent, but I know you got $45,000 from this company, you know, as a campaign donation. You know, like, how do you, 
Because I do feel like there's that, how do you try to walk that line of being able to say, I'm here to meet you as a person face to face, but mm -hmm. what if there's big money or big organizations who are there? How do you address, the meeting, you address that? The meeting, I mean, you may not be able to address it in the meeting. The meeting is about the authentic message from you as a constituent or as a group of groups. As in a strategy, if you have a legislator who appears to be beholden to one big donor or a series of big donors, you have to figure out as a strategy how do you balance it. One way you normally, like when I used to fight the tobacco companies all the time, I'd always get the doctors on the side and the hospitals on the because they were big campaign donors too. Um, uh, on the, uh, when we're fighting on Exxon, there really wasn't any money on the other side of the issue. Uh, so there, though, you had to mobilize an enormous amount of people that were borderline violent. So it was sort of like, I mean, I, like everywhere the governor went, he'd have a birthday party. There'd be like 500 people protesting his birthday party. He would have a campaign fundraiser. 500 people would show up at his campaign fundraiser. Everywhere he went, there were all of these people all the time. Not borderline violent. You get what I mean. Sorry, sorry. I'm a peace-loving guy. Um, but they were, they were angry, agitated, and willing to travel around the state and bird dog him everywhere with hundreds of people, not ten. Hundreds every time. So if you're trying to balance out money, you either balance money with other money, or you've got to balance it with lots of people. So in, in, your, in the particular scenario you're laying out, which comes up, right? You do the research, you look at their campaign donations, because you can look online. Who was the person who asked me the question about that before? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, well, there you go. You're looking it up to look in advance because you want to do your homework on your legislature. You can also go to nyperg.org. We have something called legislative profiles. You can see the, the demographics of the district. You can see their big campaign donors. You can see if they have an outside job. You can see the margin of victory. I'm updating it right now for 2018. Sorry, a little commercial. Um, so do a little bit of homework so you know what the deal is. You know that they're big donors. If you're going into talking about prescription drug prices, you see they got a lot of money from pharma. Well, who are you going to have on your side that helps balance that out? It may not be in the meeting. It may be in your coalition organizing. But if you're just a regular person, like most of you are, and you're not like me, that's, I get paid to do this, your job is to go in and tell them why prescription drug prices make your life miserable. And you have family members that simply cannot pay for the drugs, and so they're sick and dying, or whatever the heck it is. That's the real message, and that connects to somebody, like let's say Nyberg was involved, we would be building the coalitions, we would be doing the, op, you know, the, the research on where they're at and where other groups are and trying to mobilize coalitions across the state. Everyone has a role, but citizens have a role. If citizens' constituents don't care, I can do all the razzmatazz I want, doesn't mean we win. We, citizens, this is a representative democracy. They're supposed to be representing your interests. How do they know what your interests are if you don't tell them? They don't know who you vote for. You have to tell them. And if Americans do that, we change the system. So. Yeah, I just want to say one other thing. If I were part of that, and I went back a couple times, and this person kept voting for Big Pharma, I would say to that person, I know that you've taken $45 million of $45,000, and I want you to know that I'm going to write letters to the editor that talk about that, and I really think that you have been bought, and I want to make clear that we know that that is happening, and we want to see you change, regardless of who you're taking money from. So I think there's a place for that as well. I mean, Blair's a lobbyist. I mean, he has to get along with all these people. Well, um, I don't have to get along. I mean, if you ever read my comments in the paper, well, this uh, is true. They, uh, they, they certainly are not that but, popular. I mean, you have to within just, the confines of the cat. I mean, you have to feel your way, you know, and you have to see what, what kind of thing is going on. But I wouldn't say never well, say I, anything I, to get them upset. I, I, agree, I agree with Joan. Um, uh, but again, we're in the persuasion business. That's how I, I sort of view it. And as constituents, if you're unhappy with your elected official, it's very persuasive to tell them that. Right, exactly. Um, since we're we both had your hands up, you guys researched everything, right? I, is there a reasonable <laughs> expectation that someone on the staff is going to try to have looked at the person who has scheduled the appointment because they're going to have a contact name? and phone number, so is it reasonable for them to say, oh, I'm going to go look at Lori's Facebook page sure. or mm -hmm. Lori's Twitter like, to find out what I'm saying about... Yep. Could okay. be. Could be. All right. Yeah, I mean, you, you never know, right? Yeah. But, but just like that, you but... would be doing your homework, it's yeah, reasonable to assume if that 
10 constituents decided to show up at the, at the office. As I mentioned before, a guy gets 15 letters, he's shocked. Mm -hmm. 10 constituents are going to come visit on whatever the issue is. They'll be like, oh, what the heck, who are these people? Uh, and what can I find out about it? It's easy to find out about things nowadays. And you just have to ask Putin. Yes, that's just really yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have one quick question about your tactics in particular. Um, uh -oh. No, no, no. no I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you talk about, and I know you do have criticisms of, of various legislators, various other people in the public. I, and so when you do meet these people face to face, uh, does the level of confrontation change because of it? Is there a level of confrontation, or are you back to being the friendly lobbyist, uh, or a, does or does the criticism come that, into play? That's a very good question. I, you know, there are some that uh, to this day uh, still remember things that I did to them 20 years ago and here. have not forgiven me. Um, <laughs> there are some who are at the highest levels of state government who I used to work for. Uh, who view my antics with some um, discomfort, let's put it that way. Um, but there are others that understand that I can be just as useful. Again, I, in some ways, yeah, so the answer is it makes it it's difficult, it's unique to the person. Um, but I'm an easy person to figure out. I don't care about who gets elected. I'm not giving the money. I'm straight up on the bills. So the guy, I can be very helpful to them on another bill. Right? And so I deal with them on bills. I'm not there to be popular. I try to be nice. Right? So I behave like I do now. I give a couple little jokes on occasion so they can sort of see that I'm a human being. Um, but I, uh, it's all about, for me, it's all about changing public policy. We live in a society of laws. You want to change society, you change the laws. And so I'm easy. And I'm very honest about this. I don't care what party they're with. I don't care what they do. Uh, you know, in their, uh, in their life, if they're a farmer, I don't care, whatever. All I care about is, do we agree on this bill, and what can we do together to make this bill happen? Because if it's their bill, they want to make it happen. And so I can be useful because I am viewed as the guy in Albany who, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't wear any particular jersey. They have to be nice to him. That's a good point. So, so, so that's how I sort of deal with it. I try to be as authentic in what I'm doing right. as I'm asking you to be as authentic in what you do. Well, we've just gotten the hook again, so thank you for being such a great audience. And go back. Thank you to Joy and Joy. Um, we have these little feedback cards. Please tear. To be nice. Three. Be gentle. And, um, and Elena can collect them. And Elena's going to come up and give some little gifties to our speakers as thank yous. Um, and these are donated from local businesses. So a huge thank you to those local businesses for supporting our series. Wow. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blue Cashew in Kingston, Lovefield Vintage, and Samuel Sweet Shop. So thank you to those local businesses. <laughs> Can you see that you're just waiting for your appointment? <laughs> Bring one of these when you go lobbying. Well, it would be better than looking at my phone. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you.